Today, I'm talking with Jeffrey Shaler. Jeffrey was a professor of psychology for over, over 14 years. He has written numerous articles and books on mental illness and drug policy. He was a friend of Thomas Saz, who is the topic of our conversation today. Jeffrey is an expert on Saz's ideas about mental illness, the therapeutic state, drug policy, and the medicalization of human suffering. Our conversation today focuses on Jeffrey's latest book that he has edited. It's entitled, Thomas Saz, The Man and His Ideas. Jeffrey, thanks for being on the conversation with me today. It's my pleasure. Thanks for inviting me, Aaron. Yeah, I'm really excited to talk with you. I've been reading Thomas Saz over the past year, and his ideas are pretty mind-blowing, very fascinating. And I uh, read the books that you've and articles that you've written about him and with uh, Dr. Saz. Um, but to start off, why is Saz so important to you, and why did you publish this latest book about Thomas Saz? Well, in many ways, Thomas Saz is a man at least 100 years ahead of his time. He turned psychiatry on its head in 1961 when he published a book called The Myth of Mental Illness. And um, in some ways, his ideas are very much common sense. But on the other hand, they really shocked the world of psychiatry and many people who believed what psychiatrists were saying. The implications of his redefining of psychiatry and mental illness are profound, and they're profound in at least two areas. One, in terms of freedom or liberty, and two, in terms of behavioral responsibility. Now, what I mean by that is that for a long time, uh, people believed that certain persons deemed or diagnosed as mentally ill should have their freedom or liberty curtailed or deprived because they are mentally ill. Now, this this goes against some of our fundamental concepts and constitutional uh, laws regarding liberty. For example, we believe in due process of law. What that means is we cannot or the state cannot take away somebody's freedom unless they've been accused, indicted, convicted of a crime, and uh, found guilty by a jury of his peers. With psychiatry, it has become an extension of law, and some of these basic rules of law have become rules of man. In other words, people have the authority via the state and psychiatry to take away a person's liberty because psychiatrists believe that the person constitutes a threat to himself or others. Now, the fact of the matter is we cannot tell with an accuracy beyond that expected by chance whether a person is likely to hurt himself or others just by guessing about his behavior. You just simply can't do it. The, the second thing is, and this is, have, has more and more relevance today is that when a person is, is, is designated or diagnosed as mentally ill, there's an assumption there that he or she is no longer responsible for his or her behavior. And uh, on that basis, they are deprived of liberty. But this constitutes much of what is called the insanity defense, where a person commits a crime, is clearly guilty, but is declared uh, not responsible due to an alleged mental illness. The flip side of that, again, has to do with liberty, and what we've got is in practice something called involuntary commitment, where people are designated as a threat to themselves or others and deprived of their liberty and sentenced to a mental institution. In this sense, um, people who are clearly innocent of a crime they have not committed a crime, are declared, um, uh, well, if they're declared innocent, then they have a form of the insanity defense. The, um, the corollary there is that a person who has clearly committed a crime um, is innocent, allegedly, and a person who has 
not committed a crime is sentenced to a mental institution because people believe he will commit a crime. So these are the two legs upon which mental illness walks in the world of liberty and responsibility. We take away responsibility where it belongs, and we take away freedom where it does not belong. Mm -hmm. And those okay. are those are two big themes that I've come across when reading across the book that you put together and edited uh, about Thomas Saws, and also reading Thomas Saws, I've read several of his books now, he seems extremely concerned with freedom and liberty. And I guess, as I first jumped into reading Saws, is is that how you say his last name, Saws? Yeah, okay. Saws. Okay. Yes, that's correct. Now, he he seemed to be, to, to my perspective, to be overly concerned with uh, freedom and liber liberty, because from my perspective, it seems that a lot of people are very willing to get up, give up their uh, responsibility in order to be labeled as mentally ill. A lot of people would, uh, for example, like to go to the doctor and get labeled as having depression and receive some drugs that that will potentially help them make them feel better. And I, right. I see I see a corollary between uh, two dis dystopian books, which were George Orwell's 1984, where you had the coercive state, and then um, the other one where you had people taking SOMO. Uh, what was that book? A Brave New World. Yeah. So in one book, you have a coercive state, and the other book, you have a state that's really pacifying people through drugs and using more of a, a, a carrot. And exactly. so to my mind, uh, friends and family, I see uh, I've had people who are willingly take psychiatric drugs and willingly accept diagnoses that might not have any basis in reality. What was his response to those, to what I see as the bigger issue is that a lot of people are voluntarily seem to accept these labels. What would he say to that? Well, he, he would say that um, if a person says that he's not guilty because of a mental illness, when he had clearly committed a crime, he would say, it doesn't matter what you think or say, because if we have evidence that you've committed a crime, then you should be found guilty. So just because you believe a mental illness made you do it, say, for example, uh, Son of Sam, uh, Alan Berkowitz, who said that a dog told him to kill these people. Um, unfortunately, a jury bought that idea, thinking that that was a symptom of mental illness when in fact they had clear evidence that he had committed these crimes and murders and he should be um, punished or society should be protected from a person like that, regardless of what he believes is true about why he committed the behaviors. Many people want to get uh, out of responsibility in that sense. I couldn't help myself. They, the mental illness made me do it. He, he was very much opposed to this, but the other thing is, is that many people do not want to be forced into a mental hospital because in some ways this is much worse than uh, being found guilty of a crime. When a person is found guilty of a crime, he's sentenced to uh, a finite amount of time uh, away from society and, and is often uh, released based on good behavior. You have a very clear sentence for um, how long he's going to be deprived of liberty because of his behavior. When you are diagnosed as mentally ill and a person is put into a mental hospital based on that mental illness, you have um, there's no end to how long the person could be kept into uh, a mental institution. Um, the man who shot um, Ronald Reagan, um, gosh, I can't remember his name right now. Um, I'm sure you remember it. Um, well, he's been... Um, um, Gosh, I can't remember. But anyway, uh, he's been in St. Elizabeth's Hospital here in Washington, D.C. for a long, long time, much longer than if he had been sentenced by a jury. And every time he's up for a hearing for probation, he um, it, the, the psychiatrists say, no, no, he's still mentally ill. Um, and we've got to keep him away from society. But the criteria for deciding that he is allegedly dangerous are, are very dubious. There's no... There's no clear and convincing evidence that he is still dangerous. And so he could be kept in, in a mental hospital for the rest of his life. Plus, he's ordered to take medicines or drugs to control his behavior, which even though it sounds like 
something much better than being in, in a prison. Many people do not like being in a mental hospital, even if it means they're off the crime because their punishment is far worse. And they don't uh, like the drugs that are injected into them. They have very bad side effects. For example, many of the major tranquilizing drugs like Zyprexia and um, um, uh, what's the other one? Melaril and um, uh, Thorazine, etc. They create a Parkinson's-like condition called tardive dyskinesia, among other problems. And uh, these things can often produce uh, long-lasting, if not irreversible, brain problems. So um, even though it sounds like they've got an easier life on the insanity defense, that's not necessarily true. And some people might prefer to go to jail for a finite time and then get off on good behavior, whatever. Plus, when you're in jail, they're not fooling with your mind. When you're in a mental hospital, the authorities are fooling with your mind. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a big difference there in terms of what their experience is in relation to the authorities. Um, other problems that occur are when uh, people can uh, say that they get off of doing work uh, and try to qualify for Social Security disability based on a mental illness. They say, I can't go to work because I'm too depressed. And um, so then once they qualify for this uh, diagnostic criteria, then they receive money for the, from the state and uh, don't have to work. And uh, what we have to look at is whether this person can't work or won't work. Many people like to get out of working so that they can get money when, in fact, they are very capable of doing all kinds of work but simply don't want to do that. So there are a lot of consequences that are not very pleasant, and Zoss would point this out. Um, in terms of what is the experience of being in a mental hospital and uh, what about people who just don't want to uh, do the work that everybody else has to do in order to be, to be what we call an economic producer. Right. Okay. So oh, that's not too much. <clears throat> no, I think, I think before we get into a little bit uh, deeper into some of these questions, we should probably define what exactly Saz meant by – when he wrote that there is no such thing as mental illness. Can you give us a brief sure. description or ide the sure. ideas behind what he actually meant by that? Because we look around and sure. most of us know family or friends or someone in our life who's a little bit odd, a little bit strange. Maybe they're not uh, mentally ill, but what did he mean by mental illness? Well, he um, believed in illness or disease as defined by pathologists. And that means that there is a lesion or a wound, a problem with a cell. And uh, that is the true meaning of disease. You, you can examine tissue and you can see that there's a problem with the cell and it fits a picture, what's called nosological criteria, so that it can belong in a certain pathological cat category. You look up in a textbook of diseases, and you see that certain signs of certain diseases fit under different categories. When you look up mental illness, there is no mental illness listed in a standard textbook of pathology. It just is not there. And so if you look up schizophrenia, depression, anxiety disorders, or personality disorders, these are not listed in a standard textbook on pathology. Now, why is that? Because a standard textbook on pathology only deals with biological changes. It does not deal with the mind. And the mind cannot be sick the way the body can be sick. For example, when, you, when somebody dies, there's often an autopsy is performed. And people look to see what kinds of diseases or problems were in the tissue that, um, that caused their death or illness. You cannot find schizophrenia or depression or anxiety in an autopsy in a cadaver. It's just not there because those are symptoms or subjective complaints based on a person's behavior. So here again, we look at the difference between behavior and disease. A behavior means mode of conduct or deportment. How does a person behave? Now, there's socially acceptable behaviors and there's socially unacceptable behaviors. And uh, 
these cannot be considered diseases. They can only be considered diseases in what Zoss said was a metaphorical sense. In other words, you tell a sick joke or you have spring fever. Well, these are metaphors. They're not real diseases. They, they mean something, but they usually mean something that is a subjective experience and not anything like cancer or heart disease. Now, but despite those differences, many people assert that depression is identical to cancer. And this is what Zoss addressed and really blew up psychiatry on the basis of this difference. And people were very upset with him because he was right. And he still is right. A behavior cannot be a disease. Another thing that is unique about behaviors is that there's no such thing as an involuntary behavior. For example, when somebody says, well, epilepsy is an involuntary behavior, yes, in that sense, it is a seizure, a neurological change that has no will to it. There's no volitional com uh, component. Um, but when you rob a bank or you rape somebody or, or whatever, those are all behaviors that have to do with the way you conduct yourself. They're not diseases. So if you have a real disease, it may cause you to have a seizure or become unconscious or whatever. But nobody robs a bank or rapes somebody because his brain made him do it. Although people allege that this is the case, it, it just simply is not true. And uh, no matter how many times people assert that it's true, we know for a fact that that's not the case. If a behavior is volitional, then a person is held responsible for his behavior. That's another big difference. Um, if, right. if, you were driving down, if you were driving down the road and you had a heart attack or a seizure, you lost control of your car, yes, of course, and you killed somebody, yes, you would not be responsible for that. However... If you were diagnosed with epilepsy and told that in order to, to drive, you must take your medicine and you did not take your medicine sometime later, then you would be held to even a higher standard of responsibility because that was the criteria upon which you were told you had to uh, drive under. Um, you see the difference there? Yeah. Another way of looking at it is like smoking. Smoking cigarettes is a behavior, but cancer is a disease. Smoking is not cancer, although it may lead to cancer, but the, di the difference is very important. If you drink in excess, you could create a disease called cirrhosis of the liver. But drinking in excess is not a disease. That's a behavior. So what Zoss also meant, and I'll just finish this one part up, is that what we call mental illnesses really are socially unacceptable behaviors or disturbing behaviors. For example, he would say, a person is not disturbed, he is disturbing. We are bothered by his behavior. Um, but the behavior and the disease are something entirely different from one another. Right. And I think it's important to remember that uh, Saz never said that, uh, or never denied that people suffer. He's, he realized, and in fact was a psychotherapist of sorts, that help people through their uh, emotional difficulties, but he saw those difficulties as uh, what he called problems of living, things that we need to overcome to get through and live a decent life. And, exactly. uh, <clears throat> But my question to you would be, uh, and to Saz would be, what's wrong with using a metaphor of illness for problems of, li of living? Suppose a person has depression and it, they are able to uh, call it an illness and get help through a psychotherapist by using their insurance dollars. Isn't that a benefit? Isn't that a positive direction? What would he, what would exactly. your response be to that? It, his response and mine, which is the same, is that he believed in, we both believe in psychiatry between consenting adults. Um, a person should, of course, be uh, able to go to see an analyst or a therapist and benefit from that. It can be very helpful. Uh, these are very important conversations that can occur. The, the difference is, um, should we force somebody into that kind of conversation? And he said, no, it would be like forcing someone into um, a confession in church. If a person does not want to have that, 
then he should be free to make the decision to refuse treatment. Just like when you have, if you have cancer or if you have chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or whatever it is, you always have a choice to refuse treatment. Now, it would be foolish to refuse the treatment, but some people may say, I don't want to go through chemotherapy uh, for whatever reason. And, uh, and they are free to do that. That's why if you have surgery or some other treatment, you have to give your consent to do that. Unfortunately, in psychiatry and related fields like clinical psychology, you no longer have that, that freedom of choice. If the doctor, again, believes that you are a danger to yourself or others, then you cannot refuse that treatment. That's one of the big differences. But in terms of whether you should go to Freudian psychoanalysis or take drugs uh, to change your behavior, he would say, by all means, you should be free to do that. He did not think that it was a good idea, and neither do I often, but uh, he said that certainly should be a choice that a person has. So there was no problem there. The real problem is coercion. Can you take somebody off the street and force him into treatment, give him an injection of a very powerful drug, have him get electroshock therapy or whatever, talk therapy, when he doesn't want that? And Zoss would say, absolutely not. Right. And take the example of, say, a person suffering from depression. If they were to go in to see a therapist and say, uh, tell their therapist, you know, I've been depressed uh, and I've been having thoughts of suicide – that therapist, it potentially could be held liable if they don't report them and perhaps lock them up for three days in a mental hospital. Isn't that right? That's exactly right, Aaron. And uh, Zoss objected to that, and so did I. Um, a, a person should have the freedom, as, as upsetting as it may be, to commit suicide. Um, but unfortunately, um, you don't have the right to commit suicide. You can be um, committed to a mental institution if a, if a therapist believes that you seriously want to kill yourself. Or if, if the therapist does not report you, then the therapist could be sued by the family. And that has happened to many therapists. So they're, they're more inclined to say, well, I'm afraid you're going to kill yourself. So um, we better uh, have you go in for observation for three days. And, uh, and it used to be much longer, but um, and if if doctors in the hospital believe that you are no longer a threat to yourself or others, then um, you could be released. But if they still think that you're a threat to yourself, they may keep you for a much longer time. Right. Interestingly, right. though, the amount of time that they believe the person should be kept involuntarily has a lot to do with how long his insurance will cover the treatment. <laughs> It okay. doesn't have necessarily much to do with uh, how, how disturbing the person is. So you mentioned that you're a therapist and you help people with these, uh, what, what uh, Saad's called problems of living, and he was exactly. a therapist. How, yeah. how were you able to practice non-coercive treatment if someone were to uh, consider or at least express thoughts of killing themselves, is that even a possibility this day and age to be a therapist and, and work with depressed people? Sure. I, I never want to take pride in this because you never know what's going to happen next, but I believe that I have been very effective in talking people out of committing suicide. And if they constantly uh, threaten this, then I usually will say, I'm, I'm unwilling to work with you as long as you keep holding that as a threat. It's as if they're holding themselves hostage. Um, I say that, uh, you know, if you want to kill yourself, then that's a choice that you that you have. But I don't want to work with you under that condition. It's as if, well, when some people say, what if somebody is is brought to you by family who is chewing off his fingers? Um, what would you do with that person or pulling out his eyes? I say, I don't work with people who are brought to me. I only work with adults who choose to talk to me. And uh, that's a big difference. Um, we can't. You know, we can't stop somebody who is determined to kill himself. And uh, I, it certainly is upsetting. I, I'm not going to uh, say that it's not upsetting. Um, and I've known people who have killed themselves. But 
um, you can't handcuff yourself to a person to protect him from himself for days or years on end. Um, everybody has that uh, choice. Um, so, again, I reject the involuntary uh, practice, and um, I just think that a person has to be let alone. Some people will say, well, what if um, a child is threatening to do that? And I believe that children are different, um, you know, that they are at a different stage of development. And uh, even though it sounds arbitrary, um, where we draw the line between childhood and adulthood uh, is somewhere around 18 and 21. And yes, there are certainly many people who are uh, much more mature at, uh, at younger ages, say at 17 or 18, and people who are 31 and 35. And there are people who are clearly chronologically adults, but they're very immature. But we have to stick with some criteria, uh, a line that we draw. And I think that um, if, we are, if, if we think that a person is old enough or competent enough to uh, join the military and kill other persons in the army or, or armed forces, then we should be treating them as adults. And uh, uh, we can't have a double standard there where they're not old enough to um, be responsible for themselves, but uh, they're old enough to kill other people. <laughs> These are the kinds of inconsistencies that I think drive a lot of uh, young persons uh, to being very angry because they're, it's hypocrisy. Uh, you know, they can uh, vote. They can serve in the armed forces, but they're not old enough to make a decision about drinking. I mean, that just doesn't make sense to many people, and I think uh, for good reason. So with children, yes, um, we should be able to coerce them, although I think it's something that we should minimize or, um, you know, be very careful about. And also with people who are very old, demented, they have lost uh, the ability to differentiate between right and wrong. They uh, have some form of Alzheimer's disease or something sim uh, similar to that. We do we treat them differently. Um, and uh, for example, uh, you know, my father died about 19 years ago of uh, Parkinson's disease and uh, dementia associated with Parkinson's, which is not always the case in Parkinson's, but it was for him. And it was very upsetting, obviously, to be with him. I loved him a great deal, so did my brothers. And it just seemed so humiliating to see him uh, holding on to literally a doll. Um, he was a very distinguished person, worked for the State Department. But um, when we talked about whether we should give him the, the, the freedom to commit suicide, say, by drinking uh, a you know, quantity of um, morphine or something similar, barbiturates, uh, I remember talking to Thomas Zoss about that, and he said, absolutely not. You cannot do that because he's no longer competent. He doesn't know what he's doing. If he was, uh, if it was years before and he knew that he was going to get to the state and he wanted to end his life, that's a different story. And uh, I was very glad that he told me that because uh, while I did not, uh, I was not inclined to do that, to give him the means to kill himself, it certainly crosses most people's minds. You know, because right. you see them as really they're very it's very distressing. Uh, but once they've crossed the line into incompetence or mental incompetence, then uh, I think you have to treat them differently. Right. Right. Well, yeah, uh, that would be a tough, uh, tough spot. And Saz has written about um, so that that's something for all of us to contemplate, you know, that prior to the point of uh, before we cross that line, hopefully. Exactly. Um, so Saz saw that uh, people really wanted, uh, he, he thought that most people wanted freedom, but he also saw that people also are willing to accept concepts of unfreedom, such as mental illness, certain levels of uh, self-chosen coercion, such as religious constraints. Why do you think it is that people, on the one hand, do want freedom, but on the other hand, they want uh, these labels such as mental illness or uh, anxiety, depression, schizophrenia, whatever, or uh, choose certain constraints on their own freedom. What does is there any reason behind that? Well, um, I think it's because they don't want to be responsible for many different reasons. They um, they give up on life. 
They want somebody else to be in charge of their life, and they are willing to abdicate their freedom um, so that they can get money, so they don't have to work, so that they can get certain kinds of drugs that they think are okay. Um, they could get divorced. They don't. I mean, there are all kinds of benefits, or what are called uh, secondary gains, um, where even though it doesn't seem very pleasant to us, there are certain benefits from um, being labeled as having these diseases. Although I think that many people in the long run find that to be very stigmatizing. Mm -hmm. um, and while there are many families of the, quote, mentally ill who are adamant in asserting that having a mental illness is not something a person should be ashamed of, it is still stigmatizing for many, many people. I mean, once you tell somebody that you are schizophrenic, people are very standoffish and uh, they're wary of you because they accurately or inaccurately uh, think that you might hurt them or somebody else. They don't want you to take care of their children or whatever is, is going on. And so the benefits are really not as much as a person might think. Um, the drugs are not very pleasant. Uh, they're not like... I mean, I've often said to my students, um, we don't even need to have prescriptions for uh, neuroleptic drugs because nobody would take them. <laughs> and that's one of the big problems when they prescribe these drugs to people labeled as mentally ill is that they don't comply um, and they don't want to take the drugs. Now, why is that? Because it's an unpleasant experience. It's a very unpleasant experience to be on some of the very strong medications. I mean, this, this isn't like pot or uh, cocaine or anything like that, which have a lot of pleasurable aspects. Uh, these drugs have uh, one of the things that they do is they blunt affect. You can't just single out one uh, emotion that is troubling to you without blunting others. Um, many of the drugs... Um, uh, remove motivation. Um, for example, in my book, Addiction is a Choice, I talk about what may happen. Let's say a woman, I, I present a scenario where she needs to either get divorced or go back to school or get a different, get a job. And she sits at home in the dark, smoking cigarettes or whatever, um, or drinking alcohol every day. And she doesn't even recognize that she's terribly, terribly depressed. She just sits. Now, she has a husband who makes plenty of money, and uh, she, um, she goes to her doctor for a regular gynecological checkup, and the doctor says, you know, you look very, very depressed. And uh, the doctor starts asking her some questions, and the woman may start uh, crying, and it becomes clear to her that she is very depressed. And uh, the doctor says, why don't we try some Prozac or Zoloft, whatever, whichever drug, and uh, let's see how you feel. Well, so she gives her a prescription for that, and, and she asks her to come back a month later and see how she's feeling. She comes back, and the woman says, I feel much, much better. Thank you. And the doctor says, good, that's great. Now, does she go and get a new job? Does she go back to school? Does she leave her husband? Does she do things that caused her depression in the first place? No, because the motivation has been removed. And so that's what concerns me a great deal about many of these drugs. Many psychiatrists and others who are in favor of them say, well, will remove the block to doing what she needs to do. In other words, you, the drug will be like a foot up for her to do what she needs to do. Only it doesn't happen. The person is content to be where she is. And uh, that motivation to make changes is simply gone. And that concerns me a great deal. Uh, if you look back on your life, and I think most people would agree, Every time you've made a major change in your life, it has been based on some experience of discomfort. If you're very, very unhappy in your marriage, you would go to see a therapist or work on your marriage or do something and it may lead to divorce, whatever. But 
making those changes are based on some experience of discomfort. Going back to school, school is obviously hard work for a lot of people, but you know that you need to do things like that in order to make your life better. Now, what happens if you remove that experience of discomfort and the motivation to do something about it? Again, you feel good in a bad situation. That is very concerning to me. I, a young man, uh, actually he's not so young, just saw a psychiatrist. Um, he wanted to see the psychiatrist, and he had been working with me in psychotherapy, psychoanalysis, and I never... I never block anybody or say I won't work with them if they go to see a psychiatrist and put on medications. Although he was on, he was put on a very strong one called Remeron and um, he felt better. But I pointed out, you aren't doing anything in your life anymore. You're just sitting and watching television. He's in retirement age, but I said you wanted to create a, a website. You wanted to write more songs. He's a musician. But all of that drive has been removed, and he didn't even recognize that. And now that he sees what's happened, those motivations, those feelings have all been blunted by a very strong drug. And he said he was equally concerned about that, too. So there are consequences to these drugs. And uh, I personally believe that psychotherapy or psychoanalysis, I don't mean Freudian psychoanalysis, but working on yourself through conversations like that is very hard. Working through defenses, working through things that you don't want to admit about yourself, changing your behavior is very, very difficult. And certainly taking a drug to make it all go away is attractive to many people. But um, it's not the same thing as looking at yourself and making the changes that you know are necessary to change your experience of life. So that's one of my big concerns about the drugs. And I think more and more people need to take a look at that because we are a drug culture, Aaron. You, I'm sure you know that. I mean, look how many people either take an over-the-counter drug, an illegal drug, or a prescription drug. I mean, that's everybody right. is on one or more of those different drugs. Um, I mean, drugs are us. And uh, obviously, sometimes they're very necessary, of course. But it's almost like we can't live without drugs. And uh, that concerns me. Yeah. They're socially acceptable drugs. But then they're drugs that people say are bad drugs, like the ones like marijuana and, and cocaine, whatever. But um, they may not be as bad as a lot of people may think. If you read my book, Addiction is a Choice, I take a look at all that. How addiction is not a disease either. The choice to using drugs is a free one that people make. And even when you've been on the drugs for a long time, there's only one way you can get off the drugs, and that's by choosing to get it off. But you can't choose to get off of cancer. Um, you know, there are big differences, again, between the behavior and the disease. Yeah, I was recently reading uh, uh, a book by Thomas Saws called Ceremonial Chemistry, and in that he had a quote that says that um, promoting this idea that all life's problems or emotional difficulties are actually illnesses, is uh, it's, it's a myth and it's not helpful because it makes you think that if it weren't for these so-called illnesses, that life would just be uh, harmonious and we wouldn't ever have any problems. But I think Saws saw that, that life was more of a task and that we need to overcome obstacles in our life to make our life better. Exactly. Um, he's got a lot of aphorisms and good quotes, but uh, one of the ones is, um, you know, life is not a problem to be solved. It's, it's an experience to live, to, to be creative. And uh, that's what we must do. Um, not just consider life as one problem after another. And uh, yes, we've become what he called a pharmocracy, a, a government that is basically run on drugs. And he also referred to this as a theocracy, not a theocracy, I'm sorry, a therapeutic state, which is where um, medicine has been joined with uh, government, the way religion and government once created the theocratic state. He said that the Priests have now been replaced by doctors. So medicine uh, has become an integral part of our lives 
And uh, there's good stuff to that, but there's also bad stuff where doctors may have too much authority. Right. For, ex for example, he was very op opposed to um, the medicalization of marijuana, even though he was one of the most outspoken persons in favor of the repeal of drug prohibition. And I shared that concern with him. That's how I gravitated towards him years and years ago, because I came to the same conclusions. And um, I used his work in my college classes at Hopkins and at American University. And my students were so excited about it that they asked if we could invite him down. He came down from New York and gave a, a speech. And um, and at that from that moment on, Thomas Oss and I became very, very close friends. And uh, the students absolutely loved it. And one of the things the students often said to me was, how come we were never taught anything about Zoss before? And I think the answer to that is many people are afraid of Zoss because he focuses so much on autonomy. And uh, autonomy is really the death now to uh, authoritarianism. Teaching people to be independent and not need authority is the is is the type of message that he has always been giving. And the people who enjoy authority over others, from college professors to doctors, whatever, uh, are threatened by this. Um, so that book that you mentioned, Ceremonial Chemistry, is an excellent book all about the theocratic state and the therapeutic state, how one became the other. Yeah. You mentioned that uh, you eventually, after inviting Saz down to give a lecture, you guys became friends. What was yes. one of the favorite things that you remember about Thomas Saz? Oh, that's a good, good one. Um, well, he asked me to be on television debates with him, and we had a wonderful time uh, debating the opposition. And he um, he was extremely supportive of me. I remember. I used to write a lot of letters to the editor and, and things in the media and people would get very upset. And uh, he's, I said to him one time, maybe I shouldn't be writing uh, as many things as I am. Maybe I should keep my mouth shut about more things. And he was very, he was very um, certain. He said, that's the last thing you should do. <laughs> he was, uh, he was uh, very encouraging of me to challenge authority and uh, I admired that a great deal because usually the message is don't upset authority. And his message was um, the one thing that bothers authority more than anything else is to laugh at them. And, uh, yes, he was very influenced by his experience in Hungary just before World War II. And uh, I uh, was influenced by that uh, because my father came from uh, Germany when he was a young boy and the Nazis were coming up. And taking power and the threat of that kind of nationalism and authoritarianism was something that my father lived uh, uh, under a cloud of fear about. And I don't think that this was the only reason that Thomas Zoss, um wrote and did what he did, but it certainly influenced him. And through my relationship with my own father, I felt the same way. And so he and I seemed to be... Um, on the same page in that respect. And I appreciated that very much. I, uh, I naturally came to the, the point of view that uh, behavior could not be a disease. And uh, I was a chairman of the Montgomery County, Maryland Drug Abuse Advisory Council. And I served on that committee based on an appointment by the county executive from 1982 to 1988. And I did not know what uh, a controversy what the controversy existed in terms of whether we called behaviors diseases. And during one of our meetings, I said, but, but drug addiction is not a disease. You're just saying that to get insurance reimbursement or, you know, to try to get certain purposes um, solved through different policies based on this disease model. But it's not a disease other than it's a metaphorical disease. Well, I was so denounced. Uh, I was shocked by how denounced I was, and I used to testify in Annapolis before the state government bodies, and again, I was denounced, and I was amazed by this, and, and I used to tell my wife, boy, if there's one way to keep me from not shutting up, it's to try to keep me quiet, and uh, so I did a lot of writing and speaking, and I wrote to Thomas Zoss 
back in 1987 or so. And I said, look, uh, this article of mine was just published in the Washington Post um, about how therapists can be, in fact, dangerous to some people. Could you give me your honest opinion of what you think? And he wrote back and he said, I completely agree with you. I mean, look, we can't please all the people all the time, especially in this business. Keep going. Keep going. And soon after that, he uh, invited me to be on television with him. And uh, we did conferences together and we just had a terrific friendship. I used to say he was a mentor, but he said, I'm not your mentor. We're friends. And uh, the thing about Thomas Oss is that when you're a friend with Thomas Oss, you learn a lot from him. He never stops. He has a tremendous sense or had a tremendous sense of uh, humor. And he also came to my daughter's wedding. And really, some people said I became one of his uh, philosophical sons. And he certainly was welcome in our family. And uh, we just had a friendship that just lasted and lasted until his death several years ago. But uh, he was a wonderful man. He was tough. He was a very tough guy. Um, and he certainly, when he thought I was wrong about something, he did not hesitate to tell me that he thought I was wrong, which I appreciated, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I felt very fortunate in that regard. So there were many things that I really gained through our relationship. And uh, that's why I wrote this book. I kind of became his assistant or uh, like a secretary, although I don't like to use that term as much. But um, every time people tried to get in touch with Tom Zoss, they always contacted me. <laughs> And uh, I created the website, the, the Zoss.com uh, website, and opened up uh, through the Internet uh, his ideas to people all over the world. And uh, it was really a big deal. Um, as you know, that was when the Internet really started to take off. And uh, it served him very well. And uh, even though I need to update that website now, www.zoss.com, um, we get tons of hits on it all the time. And I have offered it as a public service so that people can learn more and more about his ideas. Fantastic. And it's been fantastic talking with you today, Jeffrey. I really appreciate you coming on the call and the conversation with me to talk about your latest book and about your memories of Thomas Saz. Thanks so much for being on the show. Well, it's very kind of you to invite me, Aaron. I look forward to being on it again with you. So thank you so much.